Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you here today. And uh, I, I haven't been in the pulpit here preaching for about a month, I think. Three weeks or something like that. And uh, so I hope you don't expect much in the, from the messages today. <laughs> no. Um, good to be here. We had a great time last week with uh, our missionary and uh, with Dr. Pat. And uh, uh, so I, I don't think I have, I don't have that on the uh, YouTube yet, but uh, I think you would enjoy watching that, talking about the suffering church. And uh, we were able to get more stuff in Sunday school, which is kind of unique. Um, as we begin, uh, we do have, com uh, have communion today. We do have some little receptacles there if you want to get them that have the um, juice and the uh, wafer together. And if you need one, uh, uh, feel free to go get one. Also, um, well, we do practice open communion. By that we mean if you know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior and you're walking in fellowship with him, we invite you to, part to uh, participate with us. We'd love to have you do that. Uh, but don't feel you have to, but we'd love to have you if you, if you uh, feel free to do so. Also, um, at uh, following the service, we have our Sunday school. Um, I know Brenda is ready for the little kids. And then we also have Dave is uh, going through the names of God, Dave Barons. And so I hope you'll uh, stay for that study. It's a great time to be able to talk and learn about uh, what God, how he reveals himself through his names. Also, uh, Wednesday, our confirmation class and also our Bible study and prayer time. We meet back here. We'd love to have you. It's a great time of uh, about an hour of Bible study, and then we spend some time praying following that. Um, uh, Saturday, the men's Bible study and the women's Bible study. Anything you want to mention on that? Or? We're continuing the study of Islam. Okay, uh, they are continuing the study of Islam. And so that's this Saturday, the women at 9, the men at 7. Uh, any other announcements that need to be made? Okay. We're going to be praying this morning. Uh, uh, Beth has been gone uh, this week. She took kind of an emergency trip to uh, Wichita. Her dad uh, was not doing well, and we still want to be praying for him. Um, and, uh, and praying for Beth and her family. Also, uh, I know Shirley Nelson, her mom's funeral, I think, was yesterday. I'll be praying for her and her family. Uh, also, uh, Helen's friend, uh, Maggie, uh, she broke her hip and is going through rehab, so we're going to be praying for her. But uh, let's go ahead and join together in prayer. Our Heavenly Fathers, we come before you. We thank you for this day that you have given us. This is the day that you have made. Even though it may be kind of cold, we thank you for the sun shining and uh, less wind. And so we pray, Lord, that even as we gather together, that you would just give us a freedom, that we would be willing to believe you and follow you and trust you and wait on you. And so, Lord, we uh, commit this time to you. We do pray for Beth's dad, Phil, and uh, pray that you would be helping him and I know with his confusion and with the physical problems, we pray that you would be guiding and directing in his life. I know I thank you for those that have been praying and for other issues that uh, we have presented. We pray for uh, Shirley Nelson and her family, Lord, with uh, the loss of Shirley's mother. We pray you would be helping her, and I know Shirley's uh, sister-in-law. Um, had passed away, and we pray that you would be helping uh, the family as they deal with that. We do pray for Maggie, that you would continue to help her to heal, and so we uh, lift her up to you. We ask for your help and your guidance and your direction there, and we put it all in your hands, Father. Lord, we commit this service to you. We pray for our leaders. We pray for our nation, that we might turn back to you. We know you are trying to turn us, turn our nation back to you. But whether we respond or not is really uh, up to us as a people. And uh, Father, we 
commit uh, our nation to you. We know it was founded, that it might uh, be a shining example, and we pray that we would return to those biblical roots and foundation, Lord, and we ask for your help there. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, glad to have helping up uh, front this morning, uh, Sean Cunningham, one of our trustees. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Glad to see you here. And if you'll please rise, we're going to be opening with the song 635 in your hymnals. More love, six, I'm sorry, 634. More love to thee. <clears throat> Standing in your hymnal, or I'm sorry, in your bulletin, is our response of reading, and it comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we shall be called children of God. And that, and that is, is what, what we are. The reasons the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been known, made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves. Just as he is pure. And you may be seated as we have a special selection from our mu musicians. Oh, good morning to all of you. We're going to be singing uh, or sharing with you hymn number 157, The Love of God. <clears throat> The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond 
the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win his erring child. He reconciled and pardoned from his sin. When years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so pure shall still endure all measureless and strong, redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels song. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dave and Mary. And before I do my prayer from the message, I just like to say, hi. Right, we don't do this usually, but just say hello to your neighbors. And, and husbands, kiss your wives since it's Valentine's tomorrow. And, and Chris, I love you. <laughs> I'm not seeing a lot of kissing going on over there. Okay. <laughs> Might have been a rough morning or something. Uh, yeah, it's like I, I saw this thing on Facebook today. I was going to read it, but it just went away. But it was a thing for your wife, and it said, for a birthday anniversary, a sorry. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. No, us guys never have to say sorry, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Dear Lord, we come before you today. We thank you for this day. We will be happy and joyful in it. And I just want to raise, lift Pastor up to you today as he delivers this message that we know you you were with him on while he was delivering it or he, while he was writing it and just helping him through in his prayer. And we just ask that you deliver it directly to us so it touches us all and we can all understand what it is and whatever you want it to mean for us. I ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sean. If you have your Bibles, if you'd open up to 2 Kings chapter 6, I want to thank all those who helped while we took a little trip. We, we traveled uh, a lot. We ended up, we went to... Uh, Tennessee, well, Wisconsin, saw my mom. Uh, she had broken her hip. She'd just gotten home that day. We saw my brother and sister-in-law in Tennessee. We saw the big ark in uh, Kentucky. I saw a famous uh, English pointer guy. He's 89 years old, Farrell Miller. 
Uh, he is just, he's a legend with field trial dogs and um, for, was it for my anniversary? I never get that right, yeah. yeah. Um, for my anniversary, she had called up and she knew, Beth knew how much I admired him and asked if I could, if it'd be possible for me to spend a little time with him. And uh, they said, yeah. So we went and uh, the Miller line of English pointer dogs, if you, if you type in Farrell Miller, you'll learn about him. But uh, we spent about an hour and a half or two hours probably, and he looked at his watch a couple times. I said, I just, sorry, I didn't mean to keep you, you know, and he said, no, he said, I'm supposed to go riding with a couple of guys. Uh, the field trials they do on horses. And um, he said, why don't you come along with us? Why don't you saddle up? And so this 89-year-old man saddled my horse and uh, I rode with him and two other guys that came with dog. We had about eight English pointers, rode for a couple hours. It was really a highlight. It was just such an honor. And his trophies, he had over 1,200 uh, awards in the one room. Uh, he, like I said, he just dominated um, the, that area. And my dogs have some Miller in them. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, and then we went uh, west and saw... Uh, uh, Faith and Joel, we visited with them, and then we went and saw Beth's folks in Wichita, and then Mercy in Salina, Kansas, and then we came home. So, so we did a lot. That's a lot of miles. Let's just put it that way. Um, if you have your Bibles, if you'd open to Second Kings chapter six, Second Kings chapter six, we're going to look at a severe problem and a supernatural provision. Have you ever had a severe problem? Yes. A severe problem. Maybe you have one right now. And the wonderful thing is when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we can have a severe problem, but we can also have great hope. We can know that God is in the mix. I remember one of our daughters was going through a very difficult time, and and. I was so limited what I could say to help her, and I said, I know this, that God is in the mix. He's following the Lord and wants the Lord's will. I said, God is in the mix. And if you are seeking him, if you're following him, he's in the mix. What a, what a difference that makes. In Second Chronicles 6, we're told about a severe problem. In this case, it was a siege. You know, when there would be a city and then this army goes around. Josephus, the Jewish historian, he makes reference to a siege that lasted 29 years. Can you imagine that? You're, you're 29 years old and your whole life there's been an army outside threatening to come in, cutting off supplies, cutting off anyone from coming in or going out. Of course, they had a water supply and certain things, but often it resulted in severe uh, choices that people made, and that was the case here. We don't know how long this one lasted, but we're told in 2 Kings 6, starting in verse 24, sometime later, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mobilized his entire army and marched up and laid siege to Samaria. There was a great famine in the city, the siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver <clears throat> and a quarter of a cab of some translations will say seed pods, some will say pigeon manure for five shekels. And we're not exactly sure what that term uh, is because it's only used once. Uh, some think it was a type of weed seed, very undesirable to eat, but had a high price on it. Um, so here is the severe famine. Verse 26, as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, you know, the city's walled, a woman cried to him, help me, my lord, the king. The king replied, if the Lord does not help you, where can I get help for you? From the threshing floor, from the wine press, there's nothing there. Then he asked her, what's the matter? She answered, 
The woman said, this woman said to me, give up your son so we may eat him today and tomorrow we'll eat my son. So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to her, give up your son so we may eat him, but she had hidden him. When the king heard the woman's words, I heard some groans out there. Uh, when the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes as he went along the wall. The people looked and they saw that under his robes, he had sackcloth on his body. He was in a repentant position. He's wearing these robes, but underneath he is broken just like everybody else. He recognizes his desperate need. But this infuriates him. This really disturbs him. Uh, so he says, verse 31 of 2 Kings 6, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if the head of Elisha, son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. Now why he makes mention, we'll talk about that in a second, why he be, was so angry regarding Elijah. But verse 32, now Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. The king sent a messenger ahead, but before he arrived, Elijah said to the elders, so he knew what was going to happen. God revealed this to him. Don't you see how this murder is sending someone to cut off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold it shut against him. Is not the sound of his master's footsteps behind him? While he was still talking to them, the messenger came to, the, to him. The king said, so here's the king with him, that is, this disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Have you ever felt like that? Maybe you've prayed, maybe you've fasted, maybe you've waited and said, it's just useless. Why should I wait on the Lord anymore? He's the one who's behind us anyway. Well, that's what the king was saying. We see this problem was severe, great desperation, starvation, a high price on waste and the unclean. Normally a donkey's head wouldn't be eaten. It was an unclean. The manure, if it was pigeon manure, whether it was weed, whatever it was, normally would not be eaten, but there was a high price on these things, and there was a low price on life, cannibalism. And it was also evidence of God's judgment. Earlier in the Mosaic Law, God had warned his people that if you do not listen to me, if you go off from the way of the nations around with which you, you're displacing them, you're driving them out, I'm giving you victory, but if after a period of time you start going down that road, I'm going to start applying the pressure. In Leviticus 26, 27, and 29, if in spite of this you still do not listen to me, but continue to be hostile toward me, then in my anger I will be hostile toward you, and I myself will punish you for your sins seven times over. You will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. In Deuteronomy 28, verses 53 to 55, we see that uh, if disobedience that path of disobedience was followed, then there was a curse that would come upon God's people. Because of the suffering your enemy will inflict on you during the siege, you will eat the fruit of the womb, the flesh of the sons and daughters the Lord your God has given you. Even the most gentle and sensitive man among you will have no compassion on his own brother or the wife he loves, or his surviving children, and he will not give to one of them any of the flesh of his children that he is eating. It will be all he has left because of the suffering your enemy will inflict on you during the siege of your, of your cities. How horrible. And the idea that even when they take a child, and so they're eating the child, and the rest of the family wants something. No, like dogs, you know. Have you ever seen a dog that, and you can't let a dog do this. You let a dog that gets a hold of something. Oh, don't do, you don't do that around me, boy. You know, you gotta break that. You gotta, in the words of Barney Fife, nip it, nip it in the butt. Well, here we see the, unclean animal, this high price for what normally would not be eaten. You know, there was a similar 
uh, severe famine that was written about that took place in 1316 in England. So if you're English, and I've got some English in me, uh, your, your ancestors may have participated in something like this, that there was so great a famine, uh, it was, there was such great distress, that, that the English men ate their own children, dogs, mice, and pigeons dung. They ate whatever they could. I know, I've heard of, of uh, some of these impoverished lands. Listen to the testimony of a young lady that in a country where they had no food, so to fill their stomach, they would eat dirt, and then they would basically die. Um, but they want to. So here, you know, we need to realize that even the most powerful leaders are often limited in what they can do to relieve suffering. The king stated that it was the Lord who could help because he could not. And uh, when he heard the woman's story about cannibalism of her child, he tore his robes and expressed great anger. You know, the king was wearing sackcloth underneath his robes. Evidently, the king was repenting, and he was humbling himself because of the extreme conditions. And sometimes we do not see what's really going on in a person's life. A person may have horrible things going on in their life, and they don't need a cruel word from you or me. They need encouragement. We don't know what other people are experiencing. Maybe they just got a bad report from the doctor, a horrible report. Who knows? But we see extreme difficulty can cause misplaced extreme anger. We're told regarding the king, he said, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if the head of Elijah, son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. Now, why was he so angry? Perhaps he blamed Elijah for the siege itself. Perhaps he was the person that was wanted. Earlier, remember the Arameans, they came and they surrounded the place where, where Elisha and his servant was. And Elisha's servant came out and he saw all these chariots and horses. And he cries out to Elisha and he says, so he prays. And he says, open the eyes of my servant. He saw the hills filled with chariots of fire and horses. Greater are they that are with us than they that are with them. And here, maybe that was why he decided maybe we need to give him over. I don't know. Perhaps Elijah had been encouraging the king to stand firm, to keep trusting the Lord. But now he had been pushed to the limit. Maybe that was it. Just keep trusting the Lord. God is going to deliver. And here they're in this desperate situation where even a woman eats her own son. And he says, I've had enough. This is from the Lord. Then what are we going to do? He's the one who's bringing it on us. Perhaps he viewed Elisha's waiting as the reason for the destruction of the siege had caused the loss of life within a city. Perhaps it was out of uh, anger at the Lord for what had transpired. This is a reaction that often takes place. Sometimes a person is angry at God and you happen to be in between. And so you get it. Many years ago, I had a person after a service, just, and I considered this person a friend, a gal, and she just whipped my face. I mean, she said things to me, and I still remember that day, because I went home and I spent the rest of the day in bed ball. I, I just couldn't believe it. But I also believed that there, and the Lord gave me a verse. The reproaches of those who reproached thee fell upon me. That sometimes, there's something going on in a person's life, and they are angry at God. And many years later, I found out that was a, they never apologized to me. But I found out what was going on at that time. And I was right. It was really not against me. They were angry at God. So sometimes, you may be in the line of fire. And that's when we're called to just simply forgive and even though we may be bleeding. Well, here, he was angry. Sometimes the messenger or someone close to the Lord may receive a response ultimately directed at the Lord. For example, you may be the closest visible human 
the psalmist said in Psalm 69, I quoted part of this, I am a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children. For zeal for your house consume me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. Extreme difficulty can cause misplaced or extreme anger. Sometimes it triggers uh, extreme suffering or seeing the suffering in another. In this case, the woman who ate her son sometimes serves as a trigger that brings about a visceral response. How many of us have seen, maybe on the news, where a murderer, a rapist and a murderer has killed some young girl and in the courtroom, the dad goes over and I, can you blame him? Absolutely not. In fact, I think probably part of our system should allow that, you know, because, and, and sometimes even in that setting, that person, I've, I've seen where they say the most wickedest things these people do. They've already destroyed a family but they do this thing. Well, maybe that's what happened. Maybe that's what triggered, triggered him. We see this severe problem, but then there's a supernatural provision. Now, this is a long portion of scripture, so I'm gonna hit at least part of it, and maybe I'll hit all of it, but I'll make some comments, and then I've got some other concluding remarks. But a severe, severe problem, a supernatural provision. That should give each one of us hope because God is able to step in. He's able to meet needs no matter where we're at. You know, before I came here, I pastored this church out in the sticks, and there's a few people uh, that actually were there. So I was 70 miles away from any big town, really. And the people in the church were praying for me that I'd find a wife. Because they knew with my banquet chicken and french fry diet, I wasn't going to live very long. <laughs> well, there were, there were no women my age. They were either older or younger, younger in the church. And so they were praying. Now, it would have seemed hopeless that I would end up with a wife where I was. It's like, go out there in the desert and, and you'll meet a wife. Well, it doesn't, doesn't usually work. But God knows where we're at. He's unlimited. He knows what things we have need of before we ask. And some of you have heard this, but I guess I wasn't planning on telling this at all. But, um, you know, I wanted to be the Apostle Paul. And I could go wherever I wanted, didn't have a schedule or anything like that. And I had this, I would call it a night vision. Now, it's not like I, I don't talk about these things very often, like I have them left and right or anything like that. But it was in December. And I was sleeping in the parsonage, this old house. And suddenly I saw these eyes, and they were, I just saw the eyes, and they were beautiful, and they moved this way and that way, but they were focused upon the Lord. And I shot up in bed, and I said out loud, Lord, those are beautiful eyes. If you want me to be married, I want to be married. And about three weeks later, I met my wife, and in less than a year, I was married. So if you're a single person maybe watching or whatever it may be god can a year from now you may be married if that's his timing my family had given up on me <laughs> they had always been saying things pretty soon they just quit that's when god you know did it well here we have this type of provision here is this desperate situation and an incredible prophecy. Listen, if you were in this situation, could you believe this prophecy? Could you believe this message from God? So here, the king is ready to kill him. And Elijah replied, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says about this time tomorrow. 
A sea of the finest flour will sell for a shekel, and two seas of barley, see, uh, wheat is more valuable, and two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, Look! Even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? Here is this unbelief. And this is what Elijah says. You will see it with your own eyes, answered Elijah, but you will not eat any of it. Then we're told about some lepers. They had leprosy, and they were outside, evidently in a little hut or something outside the city gate. They are desperate. Here is this siege. And they decide, what do we got to lose? So they went. We're good. We'll just give ourselves up. And they went, and they come to the camp. And you can read this. And they go into the, and there's nobody there. There's horses. Evidently, the chariot horses are tied up. There's nobody there. There's stuff strewn all over. There's food, they go in a tent, and they even hide some of the stuff, and they just gorging themselves. And then one of them says, what we're doing is not right. Here's the city starving to death, and we're out here pigging out. And if we don't do something, if we don't share this, we're going to receive judgment. You know, this is a principle that also goes with the gospel. We're called to share the gospel. We're called to share, not just sit and it's for us and we're going to make it to heaven and everything's nice. We're called to be lights in this world and witnesses in this world. Well, so they go and then they come back and they tell the, tell the, the, the gatekeeper and we're told this in verse 12 of uh, Second. King 7, the king got up in the night and said to his officers, I will tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know we are starving, so they have left the camp to hide in the countryside, thinking they will surely come out, and then we will take them alive and get in the city. It's a trick, guys. Don't believe it. It's a trick. Now, he had heard the great prophecy tomorrow there's supposed to be a lot of food. But when this message comes, he thinks it's a trick. Sometimes things seem too good to be true, don't they? Look at verse 13. One of his officers answered, Have some men take five of the horses that are left in the city. Their plight will be like that of all the Israelites left here. Yes, they will only be like all these Israelites who are doomed. So let us send them to find out what happened. Verse 14, so they selected two chariots with their horses, and the king sent them after the Aramean army. He commanded the drivers, go and find out what has happened. They followed them as far as the Jordan, and they found the whole road strewn with the clothing and equipment the Arameans had thrown away in their headlong flight. So the messengers returned and reported to the king. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. So a sea of the finest flour sold for a shekel and two seas of barley sold for a shekel as the Lord had said. Now an important point that we didn't take time to cover was that God used a rumor. He used a sound of an army that wasn't there and they fled. They look at in verse 5 of 2 Kings 7 at dusk so they go at dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there, for the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and the Egyptians' kings to attack us. So they got up and fled. So here, God used an invisible army that didn't even exist to defeat this tremendous army that had caused such trouble to Samaria. And here we have now this total abundance. And verse 17, Now the king had put the officer on whose arm he leaned in charge of the gate, and the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died, just as the man of God had foretold when 
king came to his house. It happened as the man of God had said to the king, about this time tomorrow, a sea of the finest flour will sell for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer had said to the man of God, look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, should this happen, the man of God had replied, you will see it with your own eyes, but will you not eat any of it? And that is exactly what happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died. We see the Lord's provision. The Lord used the unwilling, the Arameans. They wouldn't normally have provided for these people. They were starving them out. They had not come to share, but to lay siege. The Lord used the unseen. The Lord caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and the great army. The Lord is unlimited with regards of his ways of providing throughout the Bible. He used a ram caught by its horns with Abraham. He used the wind and quail with Moses, ravens and a brook and a widow woman with Elijah and, very, and, and, a, and an angel. And he used a fish with a coin in his mouth with Peter. God is unlimited. And that's true in your life too. He is unlimited. The Lord used the unwilling, the unseen, the unclean, the men with leprosy who were isolated from the rest of society. God chose to use these unclean men, these sickies. He used them. He used the unbelieving. The Lord demonstrated his power to fulfill a prophecy regarding flour and barley and that this unbelieving officer would see it but not eat it. Sometimes going forward reveals faith, but sometimes waiting on God reveals and also requires great faith. The king needed to wait on God. Sometimes waiting on God requires greater faith than rushing out here and there, waiting on God, maybe, whatever it may be. English poet John Milton, 1608 to 1674, he noted, they also serve who only stand and wait. A preacher of the past put it this way, beautiful is the activity that works for good and the stillness that waits for good. Failing to wait, you think of King Saul, when he was anointed king, Samuel told him to wait seven days, and he waited seven days, but when the men started being afraid because there was this army, he stepped in and offered a sacrifice, something he was not entitled to do. And Samuel said, your kingdom is going to be taken away. I've already, God has already picked a person after his own heart. He was just starting out, but he didn't wait on God. What has God called you to wait for? We don't know how God will do things. You know, if you've flown on an airplane, you weren't part of the, the flight plan. They don't let you in the cockpit. You're trusting a pilot. And you trust in lots of people that they're going to get to where they're going to be there. They're going to get to you there. They're going to land, that they know what they're doing. This is not their first time. Well, we trust in pilots. Scottish, a Scottish clergyman who lived in the 1800s, he stated, all unbelief is the belief of a lie. And that same Scottish clergyman went on to say, in all unbelief, there are these two things. Listen to this. A good opinion of oneself and a bad opinion of God. In all Unbelief, there are these two things, a good opinion of oneself and a bad opinion of God. Are we going to believe God? Are we going to believe our feelings or our own thoughts or our own reason? It seemed impossible to this officer that God could do this. And it would have seemed impossible. What's he going to do? God cause, the, cause the grain to grow up real quick and they're going to harvest it quick? How's that going to happen? There's not going to be an airplane dump something out, you know, a little parachute with lots of barley and wheat. The officer's words put a boundary or a box on God's ability. However, God's un unlimited. The officer's words revealed unbelief, and they revealed disrespect. And the Lord is able to fulfill his word, his prophecies, without our help. He used the lepers, the king, the enemy. And the Lord's help often comes from unexpected places, the enemy's camp, 
and unwilling people, the enemy. God can use anything. The world is his, and everything in it, everything belongs to him. He uses good things. He uses bad things. One of the things in our men's Bible study yesterday is that sometimes prosperity, we can't handle it. But adversity builds us. Now, God wants to bless us. He wants to entrust people. But adversity, we don't like difficulties. We think it's bad, it's, it's evil. But that's what he often uses to build us, to transform us, to change us, to demonstrate his power. He used a siege now here, what, 2,700 years later, so that we can see his power. Taking a risk can actually be reasonable. Think of the lepers. Sometimes we're called to take risks. To experience the blessings of God always requires a degree of risk. You know, a farmer and a gardener, they always take a risk when they put seed in the ground. They don't know what the summer holds. They don't know if it's going to be a drought. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know if there's going to be a bunch of grasshoppers come in. The Lord has the power and the ability to accomplish great things in a short period of time. I like that. We get used to things happening quick. God is quicker than a microwave. You know, do you want to wait 45 minutes for that, or do you want to nuke it for an hour, for a minute, you know? And, uh, well, I think I'll go for the minute thing. We'll get that over with. We'll move on. Well, God was able to transform this whole situation so quickly. And the, this officer who was trampled to death, this was ultimately a judgment from the Lord and also a fulfillment of prophecy. Listen to this, please. The Lord prefers faith. He prefer, prefers faith, but he can use unbelief. He used the officer's unbelief, but it was not good for the officer. He prefers faith, but he can use unbelief. We can be an example, or we can be made an example. Which one do you want to be? <laughs> I know which one I don't want to be. Sometimes the Lord's intervention may seem too wonderful to believe. And that was certainly the case here with that officer, and who can blame him? He was seeing all this destruction, but still, he should have believed and the degree of desperation we may feel is not an excuse for our failure to believe the Lord's ability to intervene. The fact is unbelief can hinder or prevent us from experiencing the Lord's blessings, his intervention, but it does not necessarily prevent someone else from experiencing the Lord's intervention. Our times of desperation are often God's time of intervention. Our times of desperation are often God's time of intervention. When we're at mercies, I had quoted, I'd, I'd heard a, a message that when you're, when you, um, I'm trying to remember what it was. When you're down to nothing, God's up to something. When you're down to nothing, God's up to something. She has that on a plaque in her bathroom door because she had heard it and put it up. And that is a principle. When we are down to nothing, that's when we depend upon God. That's when we cry out to him. That's what happened here. These people cried out to God. And the Lord's intervention should always get our attention. The Lord's intervention should always get our attention. God was up to something. God did something. He changed the situation just like that. He used the enemy. He used unlikely, unwilling people, but he accomplished his purposes, and he's still doing that today, and he can do that for you. Amen? Amen. At this time, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper, and so if you... Uh, don't have one of these. Does anybody, every, anybody need a little utensil we, or a thing? We have them over here on the table. And so we'll give you a minute. We think of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. We were in a helpless, helpless, helpless situation. 
dead in our trespasses and sins. One of the songs that played on First Light, I think it's by Jars of Clay called Dead Man. And Beth and I just talked a little bit. Um, I'm just a dead man laying on the carpet. I don't have a heartbeat. That we are powerless. We are really powerless. But God is all powerful in regards to what your situation may be, regardless of how hopeless it may seem. God has the power to turn it around, and he may do it quickly. I'm looking for great things to happen, and he can do it just like that. We think of how the night that he was betrayed, betrayal is a horrible thing. It's probably one of the most painful things a person can experience. And Jesus was thankful at that time. Here was Judas sitting at the table who had already cut the deal. Jesus could see right through him. In fact, earlier in the Gospel of John, he said, Have I not chosen you twelve? Yet one of you is the son of the devil. He was a crook. He had been helping himself to the finances. He was critical when Jesus was anointed for the dead. To, he was going to be dying. And uh, this late young lady came in and anointed him with oil, and it was for his burial. And he said, shouldn't this have been given, you know, sold, and the money given to the poor? Oh, it sounded so righteous. But he was of the devil. And yet Jesus was thankful. And he took bread. So if you want to take the top of your little film there, And pull that back. I'm trying myself here. <laughs> I'm going to give you plenty of time because that's how it's taken me. I mean, I got another one up here. I think I'm going to do. Okay, you pull that film back. There's a little wafer. He took bread. And when he had given thanks, can you imagine that? He knew what he was going to experience, that these disciples were going to abandon him. One was even going to leave their clothes behind. He was going to be falsely accused. He was going to be flogged. He was going to be spit upon. He was going to be mocked. He was going to be crucified. But he said, this is the new covenant. There was the old covenant where they'd offer sacrifices, but he said, this is the new covenant. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat it, uh, remembering what Christ has done for you. His body. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, the fruit of the vine, so if you want to pull back. He said, my body is broken, and his blood was spilled out. If you lose too much blood, you die. He gave his life, his blood, as a ransom for many. For you, for me, he was looking ahead. So as we partake, we are looking back on what Christ has done for us, that price that was paid, that ultimate price that he paid for us. He took our sins upon himself, the punishment for them. So as you partake, be grateful in your hearts. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your sacrifice. Think of how Paul said regarding you, Lord Jesus, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might be made the righteousness of God in him, that we might be made right with God. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, 
that we can come boldly into the throne of grace and find help in time of need because of what you've done for us. You have liberated us. We are forgiven. We are cleansed. We are clean. We stand before you pure, not because of anything we have done, but because of what you have done for us and our faith in that. Thank you that you are still working on us. You're still transforming us. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together for a last song. And may this be your prayer. Number 79, my Jesus, I love thee. May this be your valentine to him. My Jesus, I love thee. 79. invite you to stay for Sunday school. Feel free to go get a coffee and a snack over there and join us in the big room. Let's uh, go thank you, uh, Dave and Mary, for the music. Thank, thank you, Seth, on the camera, Larry on the sound. Let's uh, close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your love for us, Lord, that you could have drawn a heart in the sky so that the stars would shine and we'd always see that heart and it would be proof that you love us. But Lord, you did something so much more profound. You came down.